Welcome to the module on Cardiac Arrest Pharmacology. The goals and objectives of this talk are to cover the key medications used in cardiac arrest care. A few caveats before we begin. Mastery of the scope of cardiac arrest pharmacology is daunting and beyond the purposes of this module. We're going to provide a, an overview of the evidence-based medications used in cardiac arrest care and reinforce some key concepts to avoid confusion. Remember that your code pharmacist is there to help in a code blue situation. You can always ask advice of other members of your team. Let's begin by discussing epinephrine, which is probably the most important medication in cardiac arrest pharmacology. Its indication for use is to treat cardiac arrest or other cardiac dysrhythmia that results in diminished or absent cardiac output. Epinephrine is a non-selective adrenergic agonist Key actions in cardiac arrest are at the beta-1 and alpha-1 receptor. Epinephrine increases the heart rate, the force of contraction, and the conduction velocity, thus increasing inotropy and chronotropy. It also increases arteriolar vasoconstriction, or systemic vascular resistance. The dosing and route of administration in a cardiac arrest management is 1 mg intravenous or intraosseous push. This dose may be repeated every 3 to 5 minutes. Recall that the cardiac arrest concentration is 1 to 10,000. A picture of the box for your reference is printed here. Also recall that there is a distinction between this concentration and the concentration used in the treatment of anaphylaxis, or sometimes the initial management of anaphylactic shock, which is a 1 to 1,000 concentration. This is a common source of error, so it's best to order 1 to 10,000 epinephrine. Some cautions with epinephrine use. Epinephrine can increase the myocardial oxygen demand considerably, particularly in an elderly patient or in those with known or suspected coronary artery disease. Epinephrine also increases the risk of post-arrest arrhythmia. This is one of the key reasons why patients are placed on an antiarrhythmic during the course of their cardiac arrest care. Higher doses of epinephrine have not been shown to improve patient outcome and may in fact increase mortality. Thus, stick to the one milligram dose for your initial and subsequent dosing. Epinephrine also exhibits tachyphylaxis, and so the vasoconstriction effects will diminish over time. Your initial dose or second dose of epinephrine are likely to be the most successful. Let's talk about vasopressin. Its indication is exactly the same as epinephrine's to treat cardiac arrest or other cardiac dysrhythmia that results in diminished or absent cardiac output. Vasopressin is a non-adrenergic vasoconstrictor. It works at the V1 receptor this increases systemic vascular resistance. Also, it decreases cardiac output, heart rate, contractility, and myocardial oxygen consumption. Vasopressin is also thought to dilate cerebral blood vessels. The dose and route of vasopressin administration in a cardiac arrest setting are a 40 unit intravenous or intraosseous push. It is recommended if you use vasopressin to substitute it for either your first or second epinephrine dose. There may be advantages to using vasopressin instead of using epinephrine for your presser dose in cardiac arrest management. Vasopressin has a longer half-life and a slower onset than epinephrine. You may get more bang for your buck. Epinephrine's efficacy may be blunted in a severe metabolic acidosis. Some cautions about vasopressin use are that the evidence doesn't necessarily support its use in refractory arrest. This is the rationale for using it in your first or second vasopressor dose. It also is the rationale for not repeating the dose of vasopressin. Vasopressin, like epinephrine, can provoke myocardial ischemia. However, vasopressin is due to afterload increase, as its effects on the heart do not substantially increase myocardial oxygen demand. The next drug to discuss is amiodarone. Its indication the treatment of ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia that is initially unresponsive to chest compressions, defibrillation, and epinephrine. The key actions of amiodarone in a cardiac arrest state are that it acts as a class 3 antiarrhythmic. Remember that the class 3 antiarrhythmics have mixed effects. Amiodarone works as a beta blocker. It also has effects to block potassium and sodium channels. It's chemically similar to thyroxine and has a high iodine content. Its exact mechanism of action is not fully understood. The dose and route of administration of amiodarone in cardiac arrest care is a 300 milligram intravenous or intraosseous push. Consider using this after two epinephrine doses or as soon as possible in a ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia arrest. 
you may repeat this dose at 150 milligrams intravenous or intraosseous push. Amiodarone's precautions include that it may be prorhythmic, like any other antiarrhythmic. Be cautious if lidocaine has been given. Giving amiodarone in this setting increases the risk of asystole. Amiodarone may also cause profound vasodilatation and hypotension. Thus, giving a first dose of oppressor prior to administration is a good idea in a pulseless arrest state. Amiodarone may have negative inotropic effects as well, thus again the rationale for oppressor administration prior to amiodarone use. And amiodarone, like many other antiarrhythmics, may prolong the QT interval. Finally, let's discuss calcium chloride. The indications for calcium chloride use in cardiac arrest are basically to treat toxic and metabolic etiologies, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, or in a suspected calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, or magnesium overdose. Calcium chloride can also be used to improve contractility when epinephrine has failed or in the situation of a refractory cardiac arrest. Thus, calcium chloride is not recommended for routine cardiac arrest use. Calcium chloride's key actions in cardiac arrest are to increase contractility and automaticity. It also lowers the action potential threshold. Thus, it can stabilize myocardial contraction in the setting of metabolic derangements seen in a refractory arrest state or with a toxic overdose. The dose and route of administration of calcium chloride in cardiac arrest is a 1 gram intravenous or intraosseous slow push. This may be repeated every 5 to 10 minutes. The most significant precaution with calcium chloride is local tissue necrosis. Thus, this should only be given through a large bore intravenous line, an intraosseous line, or a central line. Calcium chloride can increase acidemia, may cause hypotension, and may cause arrhythmia. It can also cause precipitation of calcium bicarbonate crystals if it's given concurrently with sodium bicarbonate. This concludes the brief overview of important medications used in cardiac arrest. We'd like to acknowledge the media production team for the Center for Health and Technology and the Center for Virtual Care for their assistance with this production.